Hey everyone, today I want to talk about kind of what to do after you've really mastered the basics with your OPC. And this step kind of depends on what you want to do with your OPC. So if you're really only interested in external gear, uh, the next video will probably be for you because I'll probably cover MIDI and all of that there. This video I'm going to focus mostly on tracks 1 through 10. So that is all of the um, drum tracks, all of the synth tracks, and the two FX tracks. I'm going to talk about what the parameter pages do. And then I'm also going to uh, mention just like a few... Uh, I'm going to mention just a few more functions that I think will help you navigate it and help you figure out what's going on. First thing I want to talk about is the track settings. So last time we talked about what happens if you hold track, you can pick which track you're on, you can pick the plug, and you can pick the preset. You can also adjust these encoders. These encoders will determine how long is the default note length. Watch out for drone which is the furthest it goes over just because it'll cut off a bunch of the other notes and watch out for all the way counterclockwise, which was a 64th note, which might not be what you want for a synth track, uh, depending on the engine and stuff. Right here, the second encoder is going to determine the note style. Honestly, I take too long to explain these. I highly recommend you play with them and look them up. It just determines if you can play more than one note. I'll touch on them a little bit later, but um, I recommend just, I, I, there's probably people who can explain that one better than me. So if you'll remember in the last video, when I talked about tempo, I mentioned how these two affect the tempo and the swing, and these two affect the metronome. Same way, these first two encoders affect the notes. So it affects the note style, how long is the note by default, and then how many can play at once. And these two sort of affect the performance. Um, if you played in live, uh, the third encoder is quantization. So that's how close do you want that performance to stay to the grid? Do you want it fully corrected on the grid, or do you want it partly there? Um, if I hold down track, this is portamento, which is kind of like the slide between notes, for lack of a better term. I'm just going to, um, here, let's just go here, and I'm going to, oh, I have to make it another note. Add some portamento. One, two, three, four, one. So it affects that kind of sound, it's that kind of, it, it just, it makes it so that this note, it determines how long this note is going to take to go from this note's, uh, Gosh, it determines how long this step is going to take and the note on this step is going to take to go from the last note played to the one that's specified here. So I'm going to go ahead and clear that track. And I guess I'll just load a preset. So I want to talk about one weird, oh, one exception I want to tell you about is that uh, on drum tracks, these are the same. The only difference is um, for the note style right here, you have retrigger, you have mono so that's like for hi-hats if you want something to cut if you want the samples to cut each other off you have um, gate which just means that the sample will last uh, for the for no no longer than the note aside from maybe with like a decay and then lastly um, you have loop which is just going to loop the sample back so I, let me show you one that i like using loop with i'm going to go to samples and i, I think it's called Seba FX? I don't remember. Um, but I'm going to have it loop. And so it's the one with those weird sounds. If you change the note style on that, it's just not going to sound as good. But if I change it back. So there's just different uses for these types of things. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is the uh, is polyphony. I wish I would have understood this earlier. So polyphony is a bit weird on the OPZ and there's kind of several types of it. So what I'm going to do is I want to start off with the drum tracks because they're the easiest to explain. On each step of the drum track, you can fit two steps. That either means you can layer two or you can fit two recorded steps and I'll put those both the different ticks between the steps. So um, that's layered. And just as an example, if I have mono, it's not going to play both at the same time. But um, so that one was layered. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit track and shift. I'm going to change this to eight, which is um, a longer length. I'm going to turn up the metronome. And just to prove my point, I'm going to play this three times in the span of each of these steps, and it's only going to record two. One, two, three, four, one. Yeah, I was a little slow, but. One, two, three, four, one. <laughs> okay, let me show you what I actually mean. Um, I promise I know what I'm talking about here. All right. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. 
Let me see if I can have that happen even with a shorter length here. I wonder what I did wrong. Maybe I was just too slow. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, one, two. Yeah, I was just slow. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. Um, but that's the same thing on these synth tracks where if you even if you're recording in from a piano, just because it's playing all the notes doesn't mean that it's actually putting the note information on these steps because it's limited by the um, MIDI polyphony that it has. So each drum track has two per step and each one can also, the sampler can only play up to two of these, um, two of the samples at once or two of the clips from the sample at once. And so let's move on to maybe the more complicated ones. All four of these work very differently or at least pretty differently. So let's start with the bass track. The bass track will only allow its engine to be monophonic. And that's just for the engine, because if you move any of the plugs from the bass track to a lead track or to a chords track, you can play more than one note from that engine at the same time. So it's really just a, a limitation to the bass track specifically. Interestingly though, you can still fit four notes of polyphony on each step. And if you're using external gear, it will send all four of those notes at once. Or you could fit, uh, oh, let me make this easy on myself. One, two, Oops. one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So I played five on that step and it kept four of them. So it still keeps four of them on the bass track and it can also play, um, you know, a, a chord with four notes on a different track. Next up, I want to talk about um, the, the lead track. So the lead track has, I think that the engine polyphony is three. Let's see. One, two. Oops. Let me turn down the metronome voice. I don't think it's playing the full seventh chord, but honestly, I'm having a hard time hearing it. So my point is just that um, the engine has some polyphony here, but as far as MIDI goes, it still only has four. Oh, that sounds right. No, it's not. Okay, so the engine polyphony on the uh, lead track, I believe, is three, but you can have four notes of resolution, uh, different tick marks on each step, or four notes of uh, MIDI information being sent. Uh, I'm going to move to the chords track next, because it's very similar to the lead track. The only difference is that this definitely does have um, engine polyphony of four, and in fact, and it has MIDI polyphony of four, as you can see. And in fact, this one also has engine polyphony of six, but it doesn't have MIDI polyphony of that, if that makes sense. So it's it's not able to hold all six notes in one spot, but it can um, have the engine play a total of six notes at once. And that's if you have generous chords enabled, which is one of the uh, configuration settings that you can access by going into um, content mode on your OPZ. Okay, so next up, Oh, I want to talk about the ARP track. So the ARP track is kind of absurd. Um, the ARP track functions as an arpeggiator, but if you go to the third parameter page, you can turn off the arpeggiator, and I'll go into the parameter pages in just a bit here. And now it's just like a regular lead track. The only difference is that you can fit eight notes on each step for, the, for MIDI, and it has eight notes of resolution if you're recording into this. On top of that, um, just as a brief teaser, uh, you can do hit the same note multiple times and you can get them to wrap around if you use weird tricks. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna increase the, the step length and I'm going to add a multiply nine so this is a broken chord. And it's gonna play, um, on each quarter note, it's gonna play a C plus whichever note was there. So, cause it, they wrap around, if that makes sense. So what, if I really want to, I could also say, you know, I want this to, uh, I'll have it be, um, and let's just do that. Let's have it be three. And I'll have the parameter happen every other time. We'll change the step count so we can hear it. Oops, I guess I should have done it faster, but. So very different sound, right? Um, and that's because it was it was still doing the, the um, broken chord from the multiply step component. So it's just kind of, there's a lot that you can do here. And the ARP track is something I wish I would have started messing around with earlier, but I only really recently started delving into it, but it'll probably get a whole series of videos at some point. Anyway, memorizing the parameter pages. So I'm gonna go through this fairly fast 
because I think there's a lot of good resources for more technical explanations, but I just want to try to keep it as simple as possible. So I'm going to say that there's four basic pages um, for the first 10 tracks. The first one, it's white, if you can see that, or it's on the one, if you can see that, <clears throat> uh, when you uh, press shift and you cycle through them. If you're not sure what something does, you could always, while the sequencer is playing, oops, I'm going to change this back to where it was before. You can always hold shift and then it'll return to where it was, or you can add a parameter lock. And if you don't like what you're doing on that parameter lock, you can just hold down square and it'll remove it from just that step. So hopefully that makes some sense as to how you'd like play with them. So as I said, page one on all 10 of these is the same. And it's split up again into these first two and then three and four. One and two control uh, the two parameters and whatever engine you're using. If it's an effects engine, if it's a sampler engine, if it's a synth engine. And these two always control filter and resonance on these first 10 tracks. So a way of thinking of that is what sound do you want the engine to make? Page two on the first eight tracks, the FX tracks are a bit different, is the envelope. These are a bit different between the drum tracks and the synth tracks, but the easiest way I can explain it is, when do you want the sample to start? So if you start too late, you won't be able to hear your drum. How long do you want it to like have a soft sort of beginning to it? That could also mess with it a bit. How loud do you want it to be at its loudest? Or no, that's wrong, sorry. This is how long do you want that sample to last? And then um, how long do you want it to continue on after you've let go of it? Very similar for the synth engines, um, but you're using an attack, a, well, I won't use the technical terms. Basically what you can think of is, um, yeah, let me go back to the chords track. So you can think of it as how sort of soft do I want it to be? Um, once it starts, how long do I want it to go before it kind of holds and kind of settles? The third one is, at what volume do I want it to settle at? And this is, how long do I want it to keep going after I've uh, let go of it completely? So that's kind of the simple way of thinking of an envelope. So it's like, first one is, what do you want that sound engine to make? Second one is, how do you want to shape that sound? The third one is, how do you want to modulate things? So you can often check this one and know that you're on this, not just by the three, but also it's purple and this is usually flashing. It might not be if the um, if the rate is too low, you might not necessarily see that. So it's not like a surefire thing, but um, I'm not going to go into the LFO today. I think there's hopefully other resources on that. Once again, we have one and two paired. So that's going to be how big of an effect does the LFO have and how fast does it go? So that's going to be, this is in terms of, I think, 16th notes. I don't know. And then this is just in terms of Hertz. So this is just the brighter it is, or the more you push it, the um, faster it goes. Or sorry, the more you turn it counterclockwise. And you can see it with this, uh, with the, with this light, you can tell that it's going to be going at different frequencies. And this really demonstrates what um, the LFO is. These two are basically, what do you want to do with it? So we know it's speed and we know, um, or sorry, we know the amount that you want and we know it's speed. Where do you want it to go? And what shape do you want it to be? Play with these a bit if you want. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into too much depth. This is the track that is track two on um, both of your effects tracks. So this is just a way that you can modulate different things. And it's basically like you're modulating different pages, uh, different parameter pages for that track. Finally, and this is what tracks one through eight have that might cause you some issues, or it's at least very important. So this is like the sends page. One and two send to the effects, so effects track one and effects track two. This is, and then these two are basically like um, the level of the track. So this is the panning, and then this is the volume. I wish I would have mentioned this earlier, but if you have one of these and it seems to be continuous, so it gets brighter and darker, and there's a green, the green is the middle one. Um, otherwise, if it gets brighter and darker, usually that means that the darkest is going to be the, the middle one, I think. Um, so just as a review, the typical thing, especially for one through eight, is going to be what sound do you want the engine to make? What shape do you want that sound to have? Uh, what do you want to modulate on the track? And then where do you want that sound to go? Hopefully this helps you understand um, a little bit more about your OPZ. 
I'll just I'll just throw in two kind of bonuses. One is you may have already messed with this, but sometimes it's just really easy, especially if you're already switching tracks, just hit shift and just make it, I don't know, four, especially if you're just getting started. Now you don't have to enter in as much information. I kind of like that. I find it to be a bit faster. It might not fit your style though, of course. And then the second thing I want to talk about is uh, copying a track. So let's say that I really like my kick on one pattern. Um, I don't know. Oh, so that's the bad guy one. Anyway, uh, so let's say I really like the kick on this. I'm going to change to the kick. I'm going to hold this. I'm going to hold down project. I'm going to hit shift, shift, shift. So now the kick track is even flashing. And then this is yellow because that's the, the pattern that I'm on. I'm going to put it on this pattern, which is, I think, the one I was just using. Or was it this? I don't know. Now I'll move here. Okay, so that was it. So you, this, it uses the same sound, it uses the same notes, etc. So that's just a one kind of easy way of, of switching that quicker so that you don't have to manually adjust everything or load a preset. Anyway, next time I will talk about uh, sampling, uh, which is kind of limited, honestly. Uh, I'll talk about the IO track, I'll talk about modules, MIDI, and config settings, and I'll, I'll just go over kind of how to use this with external gear. Uh, let me know if you'd like to learn this in a, a different order, or if you think I skipped something big, um, I'm happy to hear feedback. So thank you for watching.